and welcome to today's STEM Plus X webinar. My name is Kimberly Blenny and I will be your moderator for today. I'm a front-end developer at Deloitte Digital, where I design and build websites of all sizes. And I have a double degree background in computer science and interactive and visual design. I'm super excited to also be working with careerswithstem.com to bring these webinar events to life. It's my passion to inspire more young Australians, especially females, to explore careers in STEM. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Woi Wurrung and Woon Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation on whose unceded lands RMIT stands and conducts business. If you're joining us live, welcome. Please get your questions ready and tell us where you're joining us from in the chat. It might be which school you're from, which part of the country you're in at the moment, or I'd love to know the First Nation owners of the land where you're joining us from if you know it. So I myself am in, based in Brisbane and we are of the Turbal and Yagara people. Today, we have an impressive lineup of people who are working and researching in the areas of cybersecurity and AI. The panelists are standing by to share their career path and answer your questions. And if you're watching this from the Careers with STEM YouTube channel, thank you for tuning in and don't forget to subscribe. Today's webinar is brought to you thanks to our sponsor, RMIT University. Maybe you're already considering a career in cybersecurity, or perhaps you're cyber curious, trying to understand what it's all about and whether the career is a good fit for you. Well, the first thing you need to know is that cybersecurity careers are expected to grow by 33% by 2030, far outpacing other careers. Secondly, with a cybersecurity qualification under your belt, you can work just about anywhere. The career opportunities are so diverse, and we'll hear more about that later on from our panelists. RMIT's newly developed Bachelor of Cybersecurity equips you with the specialist knowledge and expertise to troubleshoot, analyze, design, support, and provide cybersecurity solutions. This hands-on degree is modeled on the Australian Signals Directorate Framework, which identifies the dynamic capabilities and skills needed to combat the latest and emerging cyber threats. From computer forensics to blockchain, from cybersecurity testing to AI, you'll be ready for action when you encounter different cybersecurity challenges in the workplace. RMIT is ranked number nine in Australia and in the top 200 universities globally for computer science and information systems, which makes it a brilliant choice for your studies in IT and cybersecurity. Visit rmit.edu.au slash IT for more information. In today's webinar, you'll meet three amazing STEM professionals who are carving out super interesting careers that combine technology with threat intelligence, ethical hacking, and healthcare. You'll meet Professor Karen Verspel, who is an expert in the use of AI to enable clinical decision-making in healthcare settings. We also have Professor Iqbal Gondal, who is a renowned researcher in threat intelligence, blockchain, and remote conditioning monitoring. And our third panelist is Jessica Cruz, who is a cybersecurity and digital trust consultant, colloquially known as an ethical hacker. After we've heard from each of our panelists, we'll be taking questions from you, our viewers. Feel free to pop your questions in the chat along the way, and we'll ask them in our Q&A session towards the end. Now, before we go to our first panelist, let me share with you a little bit of trivia. It's recorded that the first cyber attack happened in France well before the internet was even invented in 1834. Uh, attackers stole financial market information by accessing the French telegraph system. Of course, the cyber threats we face today are very different. And with the growth of cyber attacks, so grows our need for cyber security professionals. Let's find out more from our panelists with our conversation starting with Iqbal. So Iqbal is a passionate about translational research in cybersecurity, malware analysis, threat intelligence, blockchain, remote condition monitoring, and mobile and sensor networks areas. He also has extensive industry experience in areas including automotive electronics, logistic systems, and online banking systems. Iqbal led the development of RMIT's new Bachelor of Cybersecurity, so he's going to give us all of the insights into the new course. Welcome to the webinar, Iqbal. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what your career has been like so far? 
Thank you very much, Kimberly, and I welcome all our participants uh, to this webinar. Uh, my career has taken a very interesting twist and turn, and initially I was a, an electrical engineer. In fact, uh, I did power engineering. I should have been working with the power line systems and, you know, all that area. Uh, but again, when I joined the industry and uh, came to the teaching in the university side, so I happened to work into the banking cybersecurity area, and that drew, drew me towards the cybersecurity and networking area. And I found it very, very interesting. And then over the time, I did research in this area as well. Um, and I have been working from last 10 years nearly in this, in particular researching some of the uh, unique solution in cybersecurity, either they are threat intelligence, either an, analyzing different type of the attacks, um, developing solution for the banks, for the government. Uh, so it's, it's a very interesting area where you are every day challenging and uh, facing new challenges uh, and applying, developing the solution for that one. Uh, so um, I see it uh, very, very exciting from the teaching side, research side, and of course, our more important industry collaboration is really, really very enjoyable. Yeah, fascinating. And there's always multiple tangents to learn about continuously in cybersecurity. So cybercrime has grown exponentially in the past 10 to 15 years. Are there any marked differences that you notice between the cyber crimes of the early 2000s as compared to today? And what is it predicted to look like in the coming future? That's a very, very important question, Kimberly, that because uh, our threat landscape is changing quite enormously. Because if you see that uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, we used less amount of the internet doing our shopping, doing our sort of learning education point of view, um, our banking and many other factors, it was far less. So now our lives are on the internet always. Uh, we access the services, either say in entertainment, education, traveling. So that creates a huge landscape, which is we call it, the, uh, it's, it's a threat landscape is a huge there. Uh, and attack surface area is a huge, that's the term which we use. So the bigger the threat landscape is, and that uh, means creates more opportunities for the attackers, in fact. So it ha threats have evolved quite significantly. They have become more sophisticated. So what we need to do is we need to learn more about that, the, about the threats, about the attacks, and then use the latest technologies like our artificial intelligence these days. And uh, because we get these uh, uh, various threats in terms of data, the patterns and all that, and we need to learn about those one um, and developing the solutions with the data science, with the AI. That's the beauty of our program is that we have got a artificial intelligence in the very first year, we're gonna teach our student, introduce them through artificial intelligence, how it can be applied for the solution development and similarly uh, about the programming as well. Uh, so that gives would give a good foundation to the student and then understanding that uh, that what would be the threats, uh, they, how they can deal with that. You are very right over the time, attacks, sophistication has changed quite significantly. Um, and attackers, they are five steps ahead of us. Uh, so we need to make sure that uh, we develop capabilities, we learn new techniques, always uh, keeps up, uh, us up to date. So we also develop solution to defend our systems far better and understanding their motives, even what they would be thinking in the future, really, because that's we can sort of uh, say a few things that the our lifestyles, our services which we use. Uh, so that also gives the opportunity to do a research, in fact, uh, and, and doing the risk analysis. You're very right. Landscape has changed over the time. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see where it goes in the next 25 and 30 years. So like you mentioned, the growth of the internet and the amount of opportunities that the attackers have to get inside and, you know, create havoc, we're also experiencing the same growth in cybersecurity careers to defend that. So how will RMIT's Bachelor of Cybersecurity help to prepare students for a career in cyber? Absolutely. I mean, that was the front of our mind that we wanted to make sure that the, our graduate, when they come to do our programs, we prepare them well through the, the base knowledge. 
and then the future sort of you know the uh, advanced courses when they do uh, they need to be well aligned with the industry and particularly we use the Australian Signal Directorate's framework, which is really gives a progression of the career from the early stage to very senior level and what type of the skill you need to learn. Uh, either it's an undergraduate program, either it's a postgraduate. Uh, so we have consulted very closely that one. And then based on that, we design our courses. And the important thing is that our all courses, they involve industry engagement. And so our student would be working on these assessments, assignments, they would be industry-based. And there is also internship program where they would actually work in the industry environment as well uh, to facing the actual problems there and what type of the challenges we have to face. So we prepare our students from the very early when they come out from their schools, we understand their capabilities and what base we need to build for them and then go in journey with them. Uh, our particularly with our, um, um, our dean uh, has developed unique model, which we call it a bootcamp to studio model. Uh, so that's a very engaged model where we teach students about the programming and then you know, and a very intensive mode. It's like an industry. Um, and uh, we have developed a unique learning environment very colorful, very rosy, and very engaging. In fact, those environment for the students. Um, so those type of the environment, they prepare very well over the time when our student will complete our programs, they would have gone through all the phases, they would be ready for the jobs of the future. Yeah, awesome. And you mentioned that part of the study career, that, sorry, the study course that they will do is involved with industry placements and industry projects. On top of the work integrated learning that students will get as part of this bachelor, what makes RMIT's course in cybersecurity different and what makes it, I guess, stand out? Our industry engagement is very unique because the, when we designed this program as well, we wanted to make sure that we consult industry very widely. So our student, when they complete the program, so they are absolutely job ready. That's our purpose is, and they, they have gone through the various different phases for that one. And again, the important thing is that the, we focus in class learning a lot of that. So rather than asking students to do the final exams in the end, so we, in, during the semester, in semester, we work so closely with our students to the building up their skills so they can do their assessments sort of, you know, and, and the results in a skill development. Uh, and which would be applicable to the industry. So that makes it of our programs very practical and linked with the industry. Um, so it's, it's it's a unique in that way. And particularly we prepare our students, understand where our students are coming from, preparing them so they can do the advanced courses. Let's say in the security testing area, which is a, of course our panelist, uh, Jessica, she is expert in that area, computer forensic area attack analysis, in incident response, in e-commerce security. So you name it, all these areas we cover. And not only that one, we also look at the soft skills as well. So particularly communication aspect as well, ethics in cybersecurity, uh, and particularly how to engage with the industry um, and the risk analysis, because security cannot be, we cannot protect everything. So we teach our student how to do the risk analysis so they can develop solution based on those sort of understandings. Absolutely incredible. Well, thank you for your insights into the new bachelor course. We look forward to see how it goes and all the students that pursue that degree. Um, I'd now love to invite Jessica to join us. So Jessica is an RMIT software engineering graduate who realized that she preferred breaking things and is working for PricewaterhouseCoopers as a cybersecurity and digital trust consultant. Jessica also refers to herself as an ethical hacker or white hat. She works with clients from a variety of industries and on any given day can be found trying to hack into everything from internal systems to websites, mobile applications, cloud services, and critical infrastructure to help make the systems more secure. Welcome to the webinar, Jess. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you've come to the position that you're in now? 
Thanks, Kimberly. Um, so as you mentioned, I graduated from RMIT in 2019 with a Bachelor of Software Engineering. Um, I actually went into that degree wanting to do what you're doing at the moment and become a developer. Um, and during the course of my degree, I learned about the cybersecurity challenge that was um, being sponsored by PwC and the Australian government. Um, and through that, I just became hooked. Um, they basically gamified um, they created what you call like a CTF, which is like a capture the flag. Um, and they gamified cybersecurity challenges. And I came in knowing absolutely nothing. We placed somewhere near the bottom the first year, um, but that was enough motivation for me to go, this is this is really fun. This is exciting. I didn't realize you could do this for a living. Um, and me and a group of friends kind of um, studied outside of our coursework um, to prepare for the next one the following year. And we actually finished in the top 10. Um, the following year. So it was it was a lot of fun. Um, and since then, I knew that's what I wanted to do for work. Incredible. And it's always great because when it feels like something fun, it doesn't feel like hard work at all. So that's great. Um, now, you go by a couple of labels and a couple of titles. Can you explain what an ethical hacker is and how do they play a vital role in cybersecurity? Yeah, definitely. Um, so basically, an ethical hacker is someone with that has been given explicit permission um, to break into someone's system or um, an asset. It could be a building. Um, and basically it's someone, our job is really to find things before other people do. Um, and we work with a number of our different clients to um, the different systems, the assets, the applications, things that we touch every day. And our job is to find things, um, report it to them and help them remediate and fix that so that um, they can deliver really safe products um, and websites for us to use, basically. Yeah, awesome. And you do that on a day-to-day -day basis. Can you explain to us what your average workday looks like for someone working in the cybersecurity industry? Mm -hmm. um, so because I'm a consultant with PwC, um, I work with different clients um, day to day. Um, I do have um, a main client that I work with most of the time. Um, and essentially I work with different clients. I work with them to understand, okay, what are your crown jewels? What are your assets? And um, what are you trying to protect? And what do you offer to your customers or to their clientele? Um, and with them, we work with them to understand, okay, this is what we're protecting we'll work with you to understand, okay, we're gonna work with you to essentially break it, um, try to find those weaknesses. And then if we do find anything, um, we'll put it in a nice report for you and help you fix fix those issues so that they're able to deliver safe products. So um, a lot of the time they're trying to protect their customers' data. And um, as you know, there's been a lot of, um, so there's been a lot of cybersecurity issues and breaches in the news. Um, our job is really to try and ensure that our clients don't end up um, don't end up there. Yeah. So you're the the buffer before the news breaks, which is awesome, so that they no one ever has to know. Uh, so yeah. you mentioned before that you're an RMIT software engineering graduate, and you mentioned as well how even though you study software engineering, you found that real passion for cybersecurity within that. How did RMIT prepare you for your career journey from software engineering to cybersecurity? Um, I think with cybersecurity, it really it's, we really need different people who think differently because our job is to put ourselves in this, particularly in my role where you're a pen tester. Um, we need people who think differently because if everyone thought the same way, we'd approach the same problems exactly the same way, we'd find the same things. Um, and we always need someone who kind of comes in with a different lens and looks at a problem differently. And cause you know, there's many ways that you could knock down a door and still gold. Um, but there's always people that would be like, I'm gonna go through the window, I'm gonna go through the back. Um, and we need people who come up with different strange um, solutions to different problems. Um, with RMIT, I think the software engineering degree really gave me a strong foundation because I do work with a lot of technical systems. And so I came in and the learning, um, something you have to understand, um, I feel like it's like this with most careers, but especially with cybersecurity, um, I feel like the environment is changing so quickly. So you're constantly learning. And I feel like um, my degree really helped me um, develop that foundational knowledge and really taught me to learn um, because I feel like learning is a skill in itself. Um, and I feel like uh, yeah, throughout my degree, I just received a lot of encouragement from like all my lecturers to um, really be curious and um, seek out uh, cybersecurity as a, as a potential career. Yeah, fantastic. And 
there's a lot of great insights there that you've just mentioned. What, I guess, advice would you give to a student tuning into the webinar today um, who's considering studying cybersecurity? Or the flip side of that is what advice would you give to your 17-year-old self? Yeah, um, I would just say that one, cybersecurity is such a fun um such a fun like fun career um definitely go for it if that's something you're interested in um but also it's such a big area um don't feel like you need to know exactly what you're doing right now um new titles and new roles are being created every day um so you might think that I want to be a pen tester tomorrow um, and that might change in five years and just be really comfortable become really comfortable with that change because um change is something that is guaranteed in life and once you embrace it it's just going to be a lot of fun yeah incredible well thank you so much for your insights Jess I look forward to following the rest of your career I'd now love to invite up our final panelists for this webinar so Karen you could join us on our virtual stage um, Karen is the Dean of RMIT School of Computing Technologies she is a computer scientist and her research primarily focuses on the use of AI methods to enable biological discovery and clinical decision support through the extraction of information from clinical texts and biomedical literature and machine learning based modeling. What a mouthful. Thank you for being here today, Karen. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how your career came to be? Yeah, no, I mean, just listening to Jess and, and her comments about um, embracing learning and, and growing, that's really in a nutshell what my career has been. So um, I started as a computer scientist. I studied computer science um, as an undergraduate um, in the States. I'm American, you can probably hear that. Um, and, and then I discovered that there was this thing called cognitive sciences, which, um, was actually very complementary to computer science. And so I started studying, um, a bit of psychology and linguistics and philosophy. And along the way, I discovered AI and specifically how we could use computers to try to model language. And, um, you think, okay, how do you get from language to health? Um, but actually, there's a huge amount of information that we collect in natural language, um, specifically in text, right? So if you think about um, all the research papers that are written, um, you think about the documentation that your GP writes when you go visit them or in the hospital, the nurses, emergency department, triage notes, like there's there's text everywhere. It's the main form that, that we use to communicate. And so along the way, um, bumping into to kind of um, challenging problems in different scientific domains, I realized, oh, these natural language processing skills are hugely applicable everywhere um, and particularly needed in, in biomedical applications. So just by keeping an open mind and by thinking about those, you know, really kind of user facing problems that we want to solve using technology, um, I, I kind of landed on, on, on this niche of doing AI in health. Hey, incredible. Now, you're a renowned computer scientist, um, AI researcher, and a passionate supporter of women in STEM. I think we both were really supportive and really inspired by Jess's story from minutes ago. In your opinion, why is diversity in STEM so important? And how can we attract a more diverse workforce to the IT industry? Yeah, look, Jess actually kind of alluded to it already, right? We need people who can solve problems creatively. And what happens when you have diversity in the workforce in, in a technology environment is that different people bring different perspectives. They come from different backgrounds. They have different experiences. And guess what? They have different ideas. And when you bring those different ideas together, then actually the, the, um, the end result is is more creative it's more innovative it's you know it really reflects um different needs it re re reflects different um yeah different experiences and that is 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 really beneficial um you know thinking about that ethical hacking example absolutely you need to kind of think out of the box sometimes right and how do you think out of the box if you're the same kind of as cookie cutter as everybody else, right? And so, so we we need diversity of all kinds, and and that means you know cultural background, linguistic background, um, educational background, like all all sorts of variations. Um, they all contribute to to basically improving the creativity and the innovativeness of of the kinds of solutions we can build. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's the same way that Jess worded it. You just need different thoughts to approach the same problem and you've got a multitude of different solutions. Um, your particular area of research interest is in artificial intelligence and its use in healthcare. Can you explain more about your research and its contribution to biomedicine and healthcare? Yeah, so as I as I said a few minutes ago, there's text everywhere, and that's really the common thread for me. So, um, but I've had to learn about biology. I've had to learn about um, clinical data along the way, and so I've had to actually go quite deep into understanding the context in which um, these 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 this language is being used, created, and applied. Um, and so, okay, so let me start with the literature side of things because people, people kind of don't, they, they forget about this, right? So, so, um, it's really important to understand that all of science happens through science communication. So every, every research result that we ever get in a lab is meaningless unless we can write a paper and, and put it out into the, into the community for other people to read. And that's how science works, right? Somebody discovers something, they share that discovery with, with other scientists, and then other scientists start asking more questions about it. They build on that. And we all learn by sharing that information. How does that sharing happen? It happens through text. It happens through writing that paper. And so um, there are literally thousands and thousands of papers written every single year that get published. And unless we have tools that can help us to kind of dig through all of that information, it's going to get lost, right? So we need to be able to find the information. That's information retrieval, that search, that's the sorts of things that, you know, we do with Google or with Bing. Um, but we also need to go deeper. And so um, a lot of what I've been doing is really trying to, to find particular um, discoveries that are described in the literature. So things like understanding um, which mutations in a gene are connected to a disease. So you know, if there's been a discovery in a bioinformatics lab that, that talks about a, a particular genetic mutation in relation to, to a disease, how can we capture that and, and store it actually in a database so that it's searchable and findable in a way that it just isn't in a paper? We all know that Google search doesn't quite get us what we want all of the time, right? Particularly when, when you're talking um, really complex topics and the more detailed kind of information is, is often really hard to find with Google search. And actually a lot of the, the um, work still is for humans to do, right? Humans, Google can help you find the paper, but you need to go and actually read the paper to, to pull out the information. So my work has been around really trying to organize those kind of key facts that are described in, in scientific papers, putting them in a, in a database, and then even more AI can be applied to, to kind of do inference and, and um, analysis of, of that data. And then along the way, I realized if I was going to have a real impact, I needed to go beyond, you know, genes and diseases and proteins and, and molecular biology and really look at how um, data was being used in the clinical context, because again, we have the same problem, right? You go um, to your GP and you start talking about symptoms that you're having, and they have to collect a huge amount of information, not just about you, but about, um, about your, your history, right? About your, your family history, other diseases that might be in your, in your family history. They then have to connect that, um, um, information to laboratory data. Um, and ultimately, they need to, to be able to compare you as a patient to other patients that have had treatments in order to decide things like which drug is going to be most effective to treat whatever is going on with you at what dosage and what kind of protocol, right? And so these decisions are supported both by understanding the real world experiences that other patients have had, but also by, again, looking back into the literature. So the research literature actually supports a lot of that decision-making. So bringing all of these things together means that, that um, we, we want to be able to, to kind of leverage technology to help manage all of that information, organize it, make it more findable. 
Yeah, your research is so fascinating and I can't wait to read more about it. As you mentioned, it's so huge and there's a lot of complexities with it. As we leverage technology more, do you think there's also risks and benefits of using AI in healthcare settings? There's always risks along with the benefits, right? And particularly in the healthcare setting, and that's actually the connection to cybersecurity, um, is that this data is the most sensitive data that, that we have, right? Our health is, is arguably the most important thing that we have. Without health, we can't work, we can't contribute to the economy, we can't enjoy life. And, and so health is really, really important. And we also know that health data can be used to discriminate against people. And, um, and so it's really important to keep all of that information private. And so there's a tension between these massive opportunities to use AI um, to help us dig through all of that data that we're collecting and make sense of it and use it to help um, support new scientific discoveries or to support clinical decision making. But we have to remember that that data belongs to a human being. Um, and it is, you know, it is, it's not about the data. It's about the person that's behind the data. And so we need to be really sensitive in, in how we work with that, with that data. And, you know, I don't think we should be talking about like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's really important that we keep working on these AI technologies and really um, make them be benefit people, you know, build them, build them so that they're actually helping people. Um, but along the way, we need to be really careful that we're not inadvertently exposing people's private information, that we're able to um, develop methods for working with that data that that um, mean that the data is secure and um, but yet useful and so there's a challenge there how can we build you know privacy preserving algorithms that still use the data but um, make sure we don't kind of leak the data out and and so there's lots of challenges that kind of um, come with needing to treat that data very sensitively and securely yeah, awesome. And it's so great to hear about how AI can help with ongoing cybersecurity threats and as they exponentially grow, so does our need for it and our problem solving. Thank you so much for your insights, Karen. What an inspiring trio of people we've heard from today. Um, I'd love to invite all three of you back to the virtual stage. Um, and we've got a couple of questions in our Q&A session that I'd love to ask. So, Feel free to answer this if you feel comfortable. Um, there's a couple here that I think might be suited towards Jeff being a recent graduate herself, but feel free to chime in. So one of the first questions we've got is, how long does a bachelor's degree in software engineering generally take? And what are the chances of being employed within your first or second year? Um, I'm happy to touch on this one um, and happy for someone to correct me if I'm wrong anyway. Um, so the Bachelor of Software Engineering at RMIT when I started it was um, typically four years. Um, something that no one told me when I started was different people learn at different paces and usually a recommended semester load is about four units. Um, for me, I was working full time while studying. So there are some semesters where I had to drop a couple units and it took me a little bit longer to finish. And that's completely okay. So I think take it at the pace that you feel comfortable with. And if that's something that you're able to do, then definitely do it. Um, and in terms of employment in, within your first or second year, um, I was, I consider myself pretty lucky to have um, landed a role straight out of uni and um, I think that's definitely a possibility there's definitely things that you can do to set yourself up while you're at university like try to really build um, you know try to do a try to take on um, like a casual job while you're at university because you'll learn a lot of really important skills that transfers into the workplace that sells really well during an interview um, join your clubs and societies because that teaches you a lot of things like teamwork and, um, you know, you clash with people when you're working together and you learn a lot of conflict resolution through that. Um, but there's many ways that you could make yourself stand out during the um, graduate um, employment process. Um, but yeah, like I think just be really re realistic. If you don't get one in the first year, you might have to wait the second year and sometimes, um, you know, it's, it's different for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, it I all works out in the end. Yeah, 
I kind of get. No, I was gonna say I, was, I can add a few words. So, um, so just exactly right. It does take um, it about four years with a full course load. So that that four years full time, um, but part of that is actually an internship experience. So we we expect all of our students to to find an internship and actually spend um, a minimum of forty weeks out in industry during their degree, and they get credit for that as well as as pay. And the great thing about that is that it's sort of, you know, it's an opportunity to learn. It's an opportunity to apply the skills that you've learned in your studies. And um, for many of our students, it means they get offered a job <laughs> right after they complete their degree because they've already had a year, um, almost a year working in a company. That company has invested in them as well. And if, you know, if you've done a great job during your internship, then they're, they're usually keen to get you to come back. Yeah, awesome. On the topic of how long um, degrees take, maybe a specific question for Iqbal is what is the length of the Bachelor of Cybersecurity at RMIT? And how do you prepare or study for a cybersecurity engineering course? Uh, sure. Thank you very much, Kimberly. That the um, particularly the Bachelor of Cybersecurity, it's a three-year program, uh, and uh, we also have the second variant of it, which we call it the Bachelor of Cybersecurity Professional. So that also allows the students to spend one year in the industry as well. So it means that it would be very much in the par with the software engineering. And because we know our software engineering has been a very successful program. And uh, I found brave enough to say that our student nearly got 100% employment soon after that program. I think Karen is nodding, so I'm right then. So that means that we really like that type of the model to be also applied to our other program as well. Uh, and similarly, that's the reason we designed this cybersecurity bachelor degrees on that pattern as well, particularly the professional one. So. It's so a three year and still during those three years, still there's the industry internship as well, but not for the whole year, for the shorter period of time as well. Um, and what prepares the students for this one, um, what we do is in the very first year, uh, we, of course, we see that the prerequisite knowledge which they have from the VCE, then we prepare them. The, our first year is a very common for all of our programs. So we prepare them for the programming, for the then particularly doing a projects in the terms of a studio, because that's our very integrated model, which is the bootcamp to studio model, very signature model to RMIT particularly, and the way it is delivered. So it means that programming fear is gone. So, you know, you work with the professional, our teachers, and they would work with you and, you know, then you, that's gone. And then you learn about the introduction to cybersecurity. You learn to about the fundamentals of artificial intelligence when you learn about that in the very first year. So you are well equipped to go to the advanced courses to learn after that. So it is your real destination, what you want to do, make out of your studies. We are there to support you. Great. I think maybe one more question from the chat that's come up is, and feel free for everyone to chip into this, I think you'll all have great insights, is what makes a good or effective software engineer or cybersecurity specialist? And does teamwork play a role in that? I think Iqbal mentioned in his Q&A earlier that, you know, soft skills like communication are just as important. So what makes a good specialist? So probably I will ask Jessica to start with, and then I can add to that one. Yeah, I was going to say, I think um, everything's a team sport. Um, you know, you're always going to work with people. Um, you'll rarely ever have to work alone, which is one of the best parts about the job. Um, you're always going to be supported and you're always there to support your team. Um, so teamwork is definitely important. Um, you know, you're, you're, always, you're not always going to agree with people and how you deal with that um, is really important. So I think really focusing on developing those skills while you're at university um, and before going into the workplace is um, quite crucial to becoming a really good cybersecurity specialist. Uh, thank you, Jess. I, I will just add a couple of other things as well to add to that one. Of course, through our program in software engineering, we equip students with all the techniques in software engineering. Uh, so the how to design softwares, the large scale softwares, the tools which they are going to be using in the industry. 
So they are already well equipped with that one. They, they, they're well aware of those. They have practiced those tools as well. And we teach them about project management because that's a really is important element. They would be doing large projects, smaller projects. So we need to equip them with those skills and those, as you Kimberly has indicated, the soft skills are part of that is a communication, teamwork, problem solving, um, and you know, working with the colleagues is all that is included in that as well. And then putting them into industry environment, doing their capstone project, they actually practice all of that. And they are supervised by our uh, lecturers, um, the way they work in that one. So it means that the, all those skills would be very valuable. And again, the important thing is I normally use the term uh, dynamic uh, capabilities. So it means whatever you learn here, that kind of gives you a base and that you are prepared to do anything else, whatever you want to do. Uh, as Jess has indicated, change is the reality. So we prepare our students to face that change. So they embrace the change rather than to be afraid from it. I'll just add a couple more comments. So the um, important thing to understand about our degrees is that whether you study um, cybersecurity, software engineering, IT, data science, computer science, any of our undergraduate degrees in computing, they all have that common core. So the first semester is um, a foundational um, programming core. And um, that, that means that our students, all of them are going through the bootcamp and studio model that, that Iqbal mentioned earlier. And particularly the studio is a, an opportunity that um, require students to work together. So the boot camp, they are together, and I hope there's a lot of peer learning happening in that in that context. We set up the rooms with tables of six students in a group. It's not a you know lecture theater. It's it's designed physically so that students work together. Um, but the studio explicitly is about um, working in teams and, and building actually quite a large application right from the first semester. So you feel, you know, I think our students probably get thrown off the deep end a little bit. But the great thing about that is they have each other to catch them, you know, and um, to, to really learn, learn from each other. And, and that kind of challenge based learning means I think that our students um, are acquiring um, much deeper skills because they're because it's not toy problems, right? It's it's actually trying to build something real, and they're working together to do that. So they're learning, you know, like Eva said, the project management skills. They're learning the teamwork. They're learning the process of building something that's bigger than what you can do by yourself at home. Yeah, incredible. I might squeeze in one more quick question before we wrap up today, and maybe this one specifically for Jess. Um, what is something you wish you knew when you first started your course? Um, yeah, so definitely was reading this question and I thought, oh, there's so many things. Um, one, it was, it's definitely challenging, but, and that's okay. Um, I think there are a few things that got me through it and I wish I acted on them sooner was one, ask all the dumb questions in class. Um, it might feel silly now, but there's going to be a breath of fresh air like there's going to be a sigh of relief from a lot of people in the room that's like oh thank god someone asked that question um and the other one is collaborate with your classmates and your peers and try to find um your support circle because um again the way they teach things might click for some people and it might not click for you right away um but i think the best way to learn is to practice teaching each other um and supporting each other through it and teaching each other the different ways that your mind thinks and absorbs information um that really got me through it so um when you start university you do have control of your schedule uh don't cram everything in in the morning and go home and think you've got all day to do whatever you want. Um, squeeze in some time to like have some lunch with your classmates and make friends and join all the clubs and things like that. Because that that was that's what I remember and look fondly on when I think back at my degree. It's just all the friends I made and all the things I did outside of the classroom as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you to the three of you for all of your insights today. Uh, thank you for joining us as well, and we'll look forward to following the rest of your careers. If you'd like to explore more tech careers and read about real-life career role models, check out the latest issue of the Careers with STEM magazine, The Technology Issue. One of the role models you can read about is another amazing RMIT graduate, Candace Bowditch. 
Titus works for Google as a security engineer. The tech issue is our special 10th anniversary special. You can find the e-edition on our website at careerswithstem.com.au. And if you'd like to keep up to date with all the Careers with STEM news, consider subscribing to our newsletters. Just scan the QR code on your screen or visit careerswithstem.com.au slash newsletters and fill in your details. You can also check out more videos from our STEM Plus X webinar series by visiting our YouTube channel. Make sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of our webinars. There are plenty more to come. And that brings us to a wrap for today. Thanks again to our panelists for giving us their time. It was great to hear all of your stories. Thanks also to our sponsor for this STEM Plus X cybersecurity webinar, RMIT University. If you'd like to learn more about RMIT Security, and a final thank you to everyone for joining us online today. We look forward to sharing more STEM Plus X queries with you in the future.